Okay, we're back again with another show, the morning show with Prince Carlton. Take it away, say it. Um, so one thing we always like to do is we like to ask our guests um, to introduce themselves uh, and just tell them so, tell our audience who you are and the work you do in your own words. Yeah. Hi. So my name is Stephanie Wynn. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm also the host of the podcast, You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist. And I'm here today to talk about our documentary, Affirmation Generation. Um, early access to the film is now out at affirmationgenerationmovie.com. And you guys have seen it. Um, so thanks so much for having me. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So, Okay, so how did you become involved with this film? Um, so I've been a therapist for about 10 years now. And a couple years ago, I started having some major concerns about the direction that my profession was moving in. And... Um, so for about a year, I did my research. I was sitting back watching, listening to a lot of podcasts, getting different perspectives. And once I put my thoughts together, I started to put myself out there. I started blogging and eventually I started my podcast. And that's how the producers of the film found me. It's hard to find therapists who are willing to speak out about the yes. scandal of gender, so-called gender affirming care. So, um, I'm really grateful that our producers are um, finding people like me as well as some of the other therapists featured in the film. Right. So do, do, do you so so okay so uh so okay so you're you're out in the the west and that's more of like a liberal liberal area do do you did you have any like type of backlash doing this uh working with this film? Yeah, and I mean especially online um because I I don't get out much. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I kind of keep to myself, you know. But um but yeah, online, I've, I've definitely been called all kinds of names. I've had attacks on my license. I've had people who don't like what I have to say on Twitter decide that they want to report me to my licensing board. I have fought to defend my license against some bogus allegations. Mm -hmm. um, so I've really had all manner of insults. Right, right. Okay. okay so so, so okay. Let, 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 let me ask one, one question. So uh, uh, when you asked the last question, you um, you said uh, so-called gender affirming care. So, yeah. what, what, and, you know, we, we've we've interviewed a few different people uh, that, that's kind of working in this area and they have different terms they like to use. What, what, you said so-called. So what's the term that you like to call it? Um, so a few names would be like child abuse or um, you could turn gender affirming care around to its opposite because I think we live in a very Orwellian time where a lot of things um, words are now used to actually mean their opposite. So Absolutely. if I turn around gender affirming care, what's the opposite of that would be sex denying harm. And, and what we're talking about are practices that physically harm a person's body because that person is in denial about um, their biological sex, which is something that you can't actually change. Mm -hmm. I would also call it malpractice and I would call it the greatest medical scandal of all, all time. Wow, that's that's amazing. Yeah, we, we, who do we, who's the guy? What was what, Walter Hayer, right? Walter, oh, 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 yeah, Walt, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hayer, Walt Hayer. Wait, did you guys talk to Walt Hayer? Yeah, yeah, Walt yeah, Hire, we, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, he's the OG. Oh, yeah, oh my God! <laughs> Wait, I gotta turn this around. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was an amazing episode. <laughs> amazing. Yes. Yeah. I, I would have watched that. I was checking out your YouTube channel before we talked today. Yeah. And I didn't know you interviewed him. I totally would have watched that. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That, yeah. That, that was amazing. Yeah, that was amazing. Every time every time we would say a term, he would, he would just correct us. No, that's not it. <laughs> 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 uh, okay. So, uh, so nowadays the schools and even like the doctor's office, we got uh, adults asking kids nowadays like uh, 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 their, about their pronouns and what do they want to be called. Do you think this is like the, the seed that, that, that plant into the children that that they could be something other than than what they are? Exactly. It's like there's so many things about this trend or this craze that are not all that new, like teenagers have always done crazy things to try to fit in with their friends and to try to pursue a sense of identity and purpose. That's nothing new. Um, teenagers have always been impulsive and self-destructive because their brains haven't finished developing yet. That is right. nothing new. What's new is that the adults are supporting it, right? Mm. It used to be that, you know, even when I was growing up, you know, if your kid was getting into a problem with drugs or alcohol or gangs, or they were, you know, having sex too young, at least you could turn to the other adults around you as a parent and say, help me protect my kid. I got to redirect their behavior. Now the problem mm -hmm. is that parents who are trying to protect their kids 
from permanently harming themselves find themselves facing this uphill battle where the other adults around them won't um, support them, won't stand on the side of sanity and reason. And instead you have medical professionals denying the reality that sex is a dichotomy. It's a binary. There's only male and female. That's not something you can change. So it's absolutely being planted from all directions in the schools, the medical system and everything. And kids are actually being led to believe that you can change your sex. They're being led to believe that there is such a thing as being born in the wrong body. Right. Right. <clears throat> what do you, you, you go ahead. What, what, what do you? What, what, hold on, let me go ahead. What, what do you believe this is all about? Well, like, but because I, because we cover we cover these topics like, like uh, a lot on our episodes. And is this about making money for big pharmacy, or is this about depopulation? We got we, we got two two different things going on. What do you believe is about? Prince, you're going to get me called a conspiracy theorist again. That keeps happening. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, depopulation definitely is a little bit more speculative as a as a conspiracy theory idea. But big pharma, absolutely, that is nothing new, right? Big pharma mm -hmm. trying to figure out how they can make customers for life. That is that is absolutely nothing new, and we've seen this before. Um, we've yep. seen bogus medical procedures like the lobotomies of the 40s and 50s, right? We've seen mm. what happened with the opioid crisis. We've seen, you know, every other kid in the classroom being on Adderall or Ritalin instead of getting outside and eating a healthy diet and sleeping. Right. Night. And and now what? Now they're setting up young, healthy bodies for lifelong dependency on the medical system. It's very profitable. So I think big pharma and also the fertility industry as well, because mm. when you are destroying youth's fertility, then you're making them dependent on an industry that's going to sell them, you know, surrogacy and all of these expensive, complicated procedures just so they can have kids because their natural ability to have kids has been destroyed. Mm. So how how, how go, go ahead. So so oh, the, the, when I watched the um the documentary, one thing that I seen is that it seems to not be any like real checks and balances. If a kid if, if a kid can go to go to Planned Parenthood and get hormones or things like that all in the same day, like who do we put the blame on to actually be checking behind and, and, and understanding that this is not real care? Well, that's that's exactly it. Right. And and the thing is, if you talk to the people who are pushing this stuff, they don't want there to be any checks and balances. Right. They use the term gatekeeping like it's a four letter word. They say <laughs> we do not want to gatekeep. Right. They yeah. talk about gatekeeping like it's a work of the devil. What do they mean by <laughs> gatekeeping? They mean have, asking any questions whatsoever. If yep. a kid comes and says, um, I, I think I'm trans. You should not ask any questions according to them, right? It's Absolutely. according to them, no medical professional should ever challenge a kid's gender identity or ask where they could have gotten this idea. Even though we know it's a trend online, even though we know that gay and lesbian kids are more likely to feel this way, even though we knew, know that kids with autism, kids who have been in foster care or adoption or have had a history of sexual abuse are more likely to come to this conclusion about themselves, you're not supposed to ask any questions. So they don't want any gatekeeping. They don't want any mm -hmm. obstacles. There are things like the gender affirming letter writing project, which are um, whole databases of therapists, people in my profession who agree that uh, they will write someone a letter, no questions asked to recommend these irreversible medical procedures. However, mm. I'm, telling you, I'm telling you what is actually going on, but the face that they present to the world when they're facing critics is they act like those checks and balances are in place. And so the way they do that right. is with these gender clinics. So they give trainings to doctors and therapists. They say, if you have a kid who has gender dysphoria and you don't know what to do, just send him to a gender clinic. We'll handle it. We're the experts. So then therapists who don't want to get involved in something they don't know how to treat they feel like, okay, I can just refer them to that clinic, just like I would refer an anorexic patient to an eating disorder clinic. Great. The experts will handle it. Well, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing because every single kid who goes to those clinics gets affirmed and transitioned. Those clinics don't assess whether someone is quote unquote really trans or will truly benefit from these procedures, which spoiler alert, there is no way of predicting. Um, and so, so yeah, it's a very well-designed system to make sure that anyone and everyone who ever gets this idea in their head, no matter what else they're going through at the time, 
um, will end up being ushered along an irreversible pathway. Wow. So, so you in the movie, uh, there's a section called Do No Harm. Uh, what what are some of the uh, the physical and mental um, um, I guess um, side effects that a lot of the uh, detransitioners uh, speak about? Sure. So when when it comes to so called gender affirming care, we're talking about a few different classes of medical interventions. So for youth, there are puberty blockers depending on how early in life. Then there are cross-sex hormones in varying amounts and sort of cocktails and combinations. And then there are procedures such as elective double mastectomy, which is where a female has her young, healthy breast tissue removed or breast implants for males. There are also all sorts of things that are euphemistically called bottom surgeries, but which basically involve um, the removal of um, gonads that produce hormones to so the removal, like a hysterectomy for females or castration for males, which then means the person will forever be dependent on, on either cross sex hormones or natal sex hormones. If they detransition because their body isn't producing wow. hormones anymore, then there are, um, penectomy, you know, having the penis removed, um, vaginoplasty is a, is basically a wound is created in the male body and it has to be, um, regularly, dilated to be kept open to approximate a vagina. Now this is made with either um, an inverted penis or if the kid has had puberty blockers or might not be enough even tissue there to work with. So sometimes they use parts of the person's colon or even tilapia skin, like literal fish skin to make a fake wow. vagina. And then when it comes to the um, phalloplasties or the fake um the fake penises that are put on the, the women, uh, it's very complicated, especially when it comes to dealing with the urethra because their urethra in females is not as long as it is in males. And so all of that becomes very complicated. So we're dealing with surgical complications, pain, wounds, not healing. So ongoing pain and complications, right? Um, then your uh, loss of sensation and numbness, loss of sexual pleasure and drive. Um, so for, and that's with some of the bottom surgery stuff. Now, let me get back to the hormones though. Puberty blockers, um, you're looking at impaired brain development and bone development, because when you inhibit puberty, you're not just stopping one thing. Um, the, the drugs that are puberty blockers, there's something called a uh, GNRH agonists. So gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists. And so they're stopping the hormones that are responsible for a whole series of events taking place during the brain and the body during puberty. Um, so that's interfering with brain development, potentially even causing some swelling in the brain that could lead to blindness. It's oh. interfering with really critical periods of bone development. I mean, I don't know if you guys have kids, but you know how important it is with kids to make sure they get their calcium and strengthen their bones early yes. on. Well, yep. during that period, uh, there's a critical window of bone development. So when you interfere with puberty, you set kids up for osteoporosis and osteopenia. The same thing with cross-sex hormones, even for those who didn't take, um, puberty blockers. So as you know, David in our documentary had severe osteoporosis and yeah. that can really impair quality of life because then you're more prone to injuries and breakages. You have pain, arthritis, you can't do things, you can't be physically active. And then if you can't be physically active, you're more prone to depression, chronic pain, and uh, all kinds of health effects. So that's just one thing. Puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones can cr create with the bones. Now, when it comes to testosterone in females, um, you know, we can't really draw a line between what are the side effects and what are the intended effects, because it might be that when a girl is sort of caught up in this idea, the transing to being a boy is going to fix her problems. She wants a deeper voice. She wants facial hair and a redistribution of muscle and fat on her body. But those same things can end up becoming great sources of pain. So, mm -hmm. um, now for one thing, a lot of women feel ashamed of their voices, but also their voices, their throats physically hurt. Um, from what's, you know, what's happened with the vocal changes, right. um, the, the facial hair and the thickened body hair, um, become unwanted because people change their minds and experience transition regret, as you know, also for females, there's no way of predicting when you inject a female with testosterone, whether she's going to be, um, prone to male pattern baldness. So some trans identifying females never lose their hair on top of their head, but some do. And then, you know, in their twenties, they're balding like men. And this yeah. creates a real difficulty 
for them in terms of deciding what to do with the rest of their lives. Because I've met many detransitioners who, you know, sort of called pass as male, and maybe that's what they thought they wanted. Mm -hmm. But then it gets to a point where they're like, I just want to accept my birth sex and come home to myself as a woman. Um, I realized that this did not fix my problems. I want to move on with my life, but now I have to decide because I look like a man, I'm balding. I sound like a man. I have facial hair. I have to shave five times a day um, in order to look like a, a woman remotely. It's, it creates this really impossible dilemma for a lot of people who are sort of lost in the aftermath. So those are a few effects on females. Testosterone can also create mood swings, rage issues. Um, it can do all kinds of things to a person's sex drive. And then if you look at the impact of estrogen in males, it can destroy their sex drive. Um, many males who are in that sort of lost in transition phase end up in this very difficult place where let's say they have um, had their penis removed. They're dependent on estrogen because they've also had their testicles removed. Now they go through a period of transition regret. They wish they could go back to living as a male, but if if they were to do that, they'd have to take testosterone because they don't produce it anymore. When they do take testosterone, their sex drive goes up. And now it hurts all that much more that they're not able to enjoy any sexual pleasure because of the mutilation that's happened to their bodies. So uh, these are just a few. <laughs> wow. um, and then we haven't even looked at, you know, early onset Alzheimer's, dementia, schizophrenia, um, the increased um, risk of blood clots, heart disease, heart attack, stroke, high cholesterol, diabetes, hormones regulate so many things in the body. And I just every day struggle to wrap my mind around how medical professionals could think that that this could possibly be healthy for anyone. I mean, even as not a medical professional, just as a woman, I know how powerful hormones affect my mood. Right. You probably had your own experience. Everyone has their own experience they can relate to of knowing how hormones affect your mood and behavior. So to yeah. think that you can just play God is so reckless. And, and we're really seeing the effects of that. And that's what our film is about. It, it, it's so crazy. When you ran, when you just ran down all of that stuff, you just said, I, I'm thinking to myself, who on earth would want this? Like, like anybody, I don't even, it doesn't even seem like nobody should want this, but I guess they don't package it like that. They, they sell it a little bit better than, than what you said. Well, they, they sell you the lie that the alternative is death. And our film tries to combat mm. that myth as well, because it's like, of course, why would you do all these things to your body unless the, the only alternative was dying? Wouldn't you rather be in a healthy body otherwise? But that's why they use the suicide threats. Um, but but our film debunks those uh, the myths about suicide. Right. So so that was, that was about to be my next question. Uh, OK, so because. When we when we see, um, I know you know Dwayne Wade and Gabrielle Union. Uh, 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 oh, you know, do you know uh, Dwayne Wade, the basketball player? Oh, well, anyway, sorry, I don't really follow yeah, yeah, yeah. sports. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, okay, so there is a basketball player named Dwayne Wade, and is an actress named Gabrielle Union. They have well, how many kids? They have uh, uh, two or three kids, but one of yeah. their son, but one of their sons is. Um, I guess uh, dresses like a a, a a girl or a woman, and it, how how old is? Uh, maybe name. 14, 15, something like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they uh changed the name. And when I when I talk about, uh, I, I'll tweet about it every now and then. And when I tweet about it, you know, I get the backlash. Everybody says. Well, at least at least she's not at least she's not uh, uh, dead. She's not about to commit suicide because a lot of these people, they, they will commit suicide if they don't go through with with this. And, and, and the film, and like you said, and your film debunked that. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Well, it's I mean, first of all, that is a well-known manipulation tactic that abusers use. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. To get what they want. And. Why? Because we're compassionate people. Like you, you harm someone just as much, if not more, you traumatize someone by holding a gun to your own head as you do by holding a gun to their head because people mm -hmm. care. And, you know, nobody wants to live with that guilt that they could have something to do with someone else's demise, a stranger's demise, what to speak of your own child's demise, which is how this is being used against the parents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for parents, they're using basically the worst fear of every parent against them. So first yeah. of all, I think that needs to be called out for what it is. And then if you look at the facts, 
there are some studies that have been grossly distorted where they basically mixed up several issues. So when it comes to suicide in mental health, which is my field, you know, I'm trained to do a suicide assessments. And um, a lot of people think about suicide, especially when they are coming to a therapist, people tend to come to a therapist during a pretty rough time in their life. So I've had conversations about suicide with hundreds of people. And I know that it's fairly common for people during their worst moments in life to have some thoughts about suicide. Um, I've worked with teenagers who are self-harming and I've, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a nuanced situation that requires professional help and evaluation. Lots mm-hmm. of people think about suicide, but what they did with these studies is they conflated the the thought of, have you ever thought about suicide with suicidal mm-hmm. behavior, which is a different thing because out of all the people who ever have a passing thought, you know, maybe you just got dumped, you just lost your job, you just got diagnosed with an illness, it's going to be really hard to live with, you're going through a depressive episode, whatever it is, the amount of the amount of people who ever have a thought that maybe I'd be better off dead, maybe my loved ones would be happier without me, maybe I should drive my car off a cliff, whatever it is, the percentage will ever remotely act on that is very small. Right. And then out of the percentage of people who unfortunately do act on that, the percentage who will complete a suicide as opposed to ending up maybe hospitalized, getting their stomach pumped, for example, again, that's a smaller portion. So when we're talking about suicide, we need to understand the complexity of the risk factors. It wouldn't be appropriate, for example, if, you know, if you came to me uh, as a patient looking for therapy and, you know, you're like, my wife just left me. And, you know, to be honest, some days I just think that the world would be better off without me. What am I going to do? Send you to a hospital just because you told me that? That would be so irresponsible. Right. I need right. to have the skills to, to, you know, ask you to tell me more about that. I need to understand the severity of the threat, the urgency of the threat, what's stopping you, what, um, what access you have, how much you've thought about this, how impulsive you are, whether you uh, have a drinking problem. You know, I need to assess all of those things to find out do I need to get you to the hospital right now or will I see you next week? And we're going to talk about this some more, right? Right, So basically they're making all suicide threat to be equally significant when it's in fact not. And a lot of these youth are being told to threaten suicide. And then when they go to the hospital, they're getting affirmed rather than evaluated. The truth with youth and suicide is that it's very often attention seeking driven by lack of impulse control and emotion regulation issues, but the vast majority of youth who have any kind of suicidal thoughts or behaviors can be kept safe at home by their parents while doing the crisis stabilization phase of mental health. Why? Because almost all parents I've ever met in a clinical setting, and I, you know, they're not all the best parents, but you don't have to be the best yeah. parent to be someone with a parental instinct that's going to keep your child alive. Absolutely. And, you know, the moment you feel like your child is in danger, you're going to do what you have to do. If that means that you have to check on your kid every 15 minutes, that you have to search the room for sharp objects and pills and walk those up in a safe. If it means that you have to go on a medical leave of absence for, for from your job in order to stay with your kid Um, whatever you have to do as a parent, you're going to do it in the vast majority of cases. And so when people are just being told, when parents are being told your child is going to commit suicide, it's like, no, your child is maybe thinking about it. Maybe they've been told that they should feel that way because of what they're reading on the internet. But you as a parent can absolutely keep them safe while a skilled and competent therapist should be doing the work of figuring out what is the severity of the threat? What are all the factors influencing this? And how can we get this kid the help that they actually need? Absolutely. And this is a passing phase for most of these kids. And when someone's in that kind of mental state, that is not at all when they should be deciding what to do with the rest of their lives. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Is there any data with uh, um, once they go from just, um, I guess, uh, trying to get gender affirming care to actually transitioning? Is there any data that says that once they are going through transitioning, does the um the rate of, of suicide or suicidal thoughts or anything does it go up or, it goes um, up okay yeah so it, okay. it's actually yeah. worse yeah so the data hey, i saw in the movie have, it said yeah i saw in the movie said 19 times higher 19 yeah. To, yeah yeah so for people who who go through these irreversible pro- 
procedures, the rate is 19 times higher and the time in a person's life um, that they're most at risk is actually seven to 10 years post transition. So we're looking at like, there are all these people who are looking at kids who are like six months after getting so-called top surgery. And they're just so happy. Well, there's the placebo effect. There's the fact that they finally got this thing that they thought they wanted. Of course, they're in that initial honeymoon phase and cross sex hormones are very powerful drugs as well. That can give people absolutely feelings of euphoria if that's what they've been hoping for. Right. right. But, but we need to look at the long term, right. And we know at the long term, seven to 10 years is, is the highest risk. And at that point it can be 19 times higher. And of, of course, right. Because, because you're in pain, right. you're likely to be disabled, have difficulty finding a romantic partner. It, these procedures and these hormones, they take away the things that protect people. If you attend any training as a therapist, which every therapist has to do on suicide prevention, you do understand that you need to assess risk factors and protective factors. One of the greatest protective factors is responsibility to other people. Loving your kids will get you a long way. If you are an adult going through depression, but you have a family to be responsible for, I'm not saying it's going to save your life, but most of the time it is the number one reason that you have not acted on those dark thoughts. So we're taking that away from people. We're taking away their ability to love and connect with other people, to have families. We're taking away the health that would enable them to do healthy coping mechanisms like sports and exercise. It's a disaster. Wow. Yeah, well, yeah. So we, we just got a couple more questions. So um, there's a statement in the movie about um, the U.S. is getting more out of step with the other countries uh, when it comes to this issue. Uh, what are some things that the other countries are putting in place uh, that the U.S. is not? Yeah, so there's um, there's a technical term that a lot of countries have called for a systematic review of the evidence, and it has been done in various parts of Europe. It's been done here in the US and Florida. Um, so uh, one thing that like in the UK, there um, there was a CAS review you might have heard of. And uh, the CAS review is still underway, but the interim report, so basically the partial findings in the process of reviewing was that there is not a good evidence base for justifying these medical interventions. Um, so systematic review of the evidence is something that is, um, that we need to do in the U S and then, um, protecting youth. So right now there is a lot of legislation going back and forth in different States where you have, um, some States passing laws to ban these hormones procedures for youth at the same time, you have other States, unfortunately, like mine, Oregon, that are trying to become these so-called refuge States that are actually encouraging kids to run away from their parents and come to Planned Parenthood and, Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's honestly happening so fast. I can't even um, keep up. But we, you know, I believe that we need legislation to protect minors from making irreversible decisions. Yeah. 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 It's a it's it's crazy because we because we got a uh, I think our whole our whole house now is 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 a Democrat majority and they pass. I think we have something similar to what California has now. Like I, I think it's like a trans refuge it, it, state. So yeah, yeah. You you can cross state lines and yep. uh, without it, you know it's just a lot of a lot of decisions being made without parental consent. So it yeah. just it just opens the door wide open for so much abuse to happen. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. So, it's yeah. like. And we, you know, we just, um, there's a bill going through our house right now in Oregon that's like that, that's kind of modeled after the California law. And it like, so it removes any lower age for how young um, someone could be. And of course the language isn't gendered, but we know it's all females who are seeking birth control and abortions, right? So now they want it to be that a 12 year old can go get an abortion or the morning after pill. And my thought is always like, who do you think is getting 12 year olds pregnant? Do you think right, this right. is like good people that you're protecting from right, bad right. parents? Yes. Like who benefits from a girl, from a 12 year old girl's parents, not knowing that she's pregnant? Oh my gosh. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's crazy. Okay. Let, let me, okay. So we got, we got really got one more question, but I, I want to ask you this. Um, do you know what percentage would you, if you could just guess, what percentage would you guess have had these changes, uh, women or men had these changes and are actually happy 
like like at, at a later age into their 40s, 50s and stuff like that. W- w- do you have like a percentage that you could say? I have no idea because we don't we don't have that long term data, because if you look at the exponential rate of growth where there's been a 4000 percent increase just in the last several years of right. these girls. So this is a really new thing. Now, yeah. I know you mentioned Walt Heyer earlier. He's like an old school detransitioner. Yep. You know, I've also talked to um, an old school therapist who worked with detransitioners since I was a child. He's first started talking to people with transition regret in the early 90s. Um, so we definitely know that of people who had these so-called sex change procedures way back when, that there were high rates of suicide and regret. Um, but you know, this is a whole new demographic we're seeing all these young right. girls getting these double mastectomies. We don't have the long-term data, but there was a study that we looked at in the film that looked at, um, for people with TRICARE insurance, which is basically that, uh, you or someone in your family is in the military. Now, I believe that people with TRICARE insurance, if, if you have it, that's the same insurance you keep for life, but I can't be sure because I haven't looked into how that specific insurance is set up for the military and their family. Right. But it looked at for people who have TRICARE insurance, the continuation rate of hormones. So rather than asking people specifically about detransition, which is what Lisa Littman did, which is also very valuable, this looked at how many people are going on these hormones, but then are they still taking them down the line? And it looked at eight or nine years of data and found that overall, after four years, the continuation rate for cross-sex hormones was only about 70%. So if we're looking at that data, what does that tell you? Well, that tells you after four years, the discontinuation rate is 30%, either discontinuation or death, right? Right. But now critics of the study have said that, well, what if their insurance changes? No, I haven't been able to look at that. Uh, Although I Mm. do think people stick with their military insurance, but um, I do think that we have a growing body of evidence. The detransition rate is a lot higher than anyone would want us to believe who's who's still in favor of this stuff. Right. right. And of course, because, you know, you're, you're, people are doing this stuff on a whim in response to a trend. So, of course, they're going to end up with regrets. Absolutely. We, we, we appreciate you so much for coming on and we, we enjoy the documentary. Absolutely. We enjoyed it. Me and my wife watched it yesterday. It is, it, is oh my gosh. I'm a, I am ai can not wait to share this with everybody. Um, oh, thanks so much. Yes. Do, do you have any like upcoming events coming up or you have any, uh, do you want to tell our audience where to find you at? Yeah. I'm so glad that you asked about upcoming events. Um, there is an event in Texas coming up soon for those who are able to make it to Austin, Texas, or who live in Austin, Texas, but I, but your show is mostly local listeners. So that's, right. <laughs> but um, <laughs> right. yeah, well, if you feel like um, getting out of Minneapolis and going down to Austin for a few days mm-hmm. on April 20th, there's an event called it's bigger than Texas put on by partners for ethical care. There's going to be a really wonderful discussion panel the following day, Friday, April 21st, there's going to be a screening of affirmation generation and a screening of detransition diaries. And there's going to be Q and A's with people featured in the film. So detransition diaries is going to be a Q and A with Jennifer Lal, who created it. Um, affirmation generation. There's going to be a Q and A with a couple of detransitioners. I was going to be there, but my plans changed. Um, so that's oh. the event. That's the event that we have coming up in Texas. As for where to find us, so anyone can watch early access to the documentary now, you just go to affirmationgenerationmovie.com, click the Vimeo link, and that'll take you to stream it. You can follow Affirmation Generation on Twitter at 2022Affirmation. You can follow Affirmation Generation on Instagram at Affirmation Generation, and you can follow me on either of those platforms at Some Therapist, and you can find my podcast on any platform or on YouTube. It's called You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist. Thank you very much. I, I, was, I was about to say, we just came from uh, 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 Austin, Texas, from uh, South by Southwest. We did media coverage down there. And okay. hey, you heard of South by Southwest, the music festival? Oh, I've heard of it, but I've never been. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. Austin is an amazing city. Yeah. So that should be a good turnout. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Bye bye.